The Dogons were already on American land because they simply sailed over by way of the worldwide wind and currents. The first Africans to set foot on American soil were in fact the Dogons of Mali who used such currents as the Canary and the North Equilateral Current that recycles from West Africa to America and into the upper Atlantic Ocean. This was before the invention of sails. The Guinea current flows eastward along the Guinea coast with frequent cycles out to the sea where it joins the South Equatorial. The second group of Africans to land in America were under the leadership of Abu Bakari in 1311 and had mixed in with the Omex and became known as the Washo. The third group of Africans to land on American soil were the Idrisids who were the ruling dynasty of southern Morocco and Mauritania who came into Morocco before the invasion by the Dogon Malians and the Senegalese. This group of Moors arrived in 1727 with Mensa Khan Musa who was searching for his ancestors of Abu Bakari. And indeed, the Washos were Moors. Let's go back a little bit more and explore this topic about the Moors. I previously stated that the Omex were of Mali and that does make them Moors. Absolutely, the Omex were indeed Malian Moors. The Mayans were the descendants of the Malian Moors and were often referred to as Black Mexicans or Quetzalcoatl. There are ancient Mexican wall paintings that depict these Negroid kings as rulers and are unmistakably African. These Moors were the people who built the Great Pyramids all over South America, Peru, Canada, Alaska, and Georgia. Scattered all throughout North America along the Mississippi River and its tributaries are found mounds built out of tons of earth. Tons and tons of earth. The people who built them were called the Mound Builders and they were the descendants of the Malian Moors, the Olmecs. These Moors eventually migrated to North America from Mexico and became known as the Washita, the Yamasi, and the Ben Ismael tribe. The Ben Ismael tribe was a collection of what is known as the Lenape, the Wapenong, and the Nanticoc Indians who migrated to Indiana and Illinois and referred to themselves as Moors, even though the United States government continued to classify them as Negroes in order to strip them of their indigenous rights. It is often not talked about, but the Moors had enslaved the Europeans before they enslaved blacks. Their women were sold like commodities into the harems and as concubines of wealthy Moors. This is the reason why the Moorish noble were for the most part bleached out and became as tawny Moors, Turks and Arabs which are no more than fixed mulatto races. This is also the reason for the Moors in the coats of arms of the noble European families, the so-called black nobility of Europe. The European nations paid tribute to the Moors well into the 18th century. In the book, The United States and Barbary Powers, the English, French, Dutch, Danes, and Swedes, and may I say all nations, are tributary to them. David McRitchie in the book, Ancient and Modern Britons, says the word blackmail is the result of this tribute paid to the black army or black oppressors as the English referred to them. The Moors had control of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. This is why the Marines sing of defeating the Moors from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, confirming the extent of the Moorish empire and dominions of Amexum or Atlantis. Here you see the first page of the Moroccan Treaty of 1787. It should also be noted that Shakespeare's most famous Moor, Othello, is also described as a black African. Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin worked closely with Moors in the Continental Congress to secure this treaty. In the Bevins collection, there are over 200 letters to the Bay of Morocco from the Continental Congress. There were many Moors in the Continental Congress working with the European Masons originally taught by the Moors to form Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new secular order of the ages, E Pluribus Unum, out of many peoples, nations one. The Moroccan treaty is very powerful because according to the constitution, treaties are the law of the land. 
This treaty specifically deals with Moors. The question that may arise, how do we know that where the treaty says Moors, the so-called black people of the time is being referred to? The Moors were considered citizens or part of the we the people who ratified the constitution. It says, quote, thus an act was passed in Massachusetts on the 6th of March, 1788, forbidding any Negro, not a subject of the empire of Morocco or a citizen of the United States from tarrying in the Commonwealth, unquote. For this would show that those who were referred to as Negroes were actually Moors and that they were on the same footing or status as citizens. Those who remembered that they were Moors used the Moroccan Treaty of 1787 to secure the rights on the same footing as the state citizens without otherwise being obligated members of their social equality. While those who were brainwashed into believing they were Negroes, descendants of Africans brought here by Europeans, were unprotected by the Moroccan Treaty, as well as the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. This document says, and I quote, A petition was presented to the House from free sundry Moors, subjects of the Emperor of Morocco, and residents in this state, praying that in case they should commit any fault amendable to be brought to justice, that they as subjects to a prince here in North America, in alliance with the United States of America, via the Moroccan Treaty of 1787, may be tried under the same laws as the citizens of the state would be liable to be tried, and not under the Negro Act, which was received and read. End quote. Thus, you have Moors back in 1789 saying what we say now. Our nationality is Moorish, not Negro, Black, Colored, etc. Yeah. <laughs>